Um, so I'm delighted that uh, we have a panel of uh, four people who have worked extensively um, on issues of uh, bank instability and financial market upsets, if you want. And we thought uh, now is the time that we should really revisit these topics, as you probably saw Michael Barmer made some announcement this morning even. Um, so this is our panel on recent bank runs and financial instability. And um, we will have Virala Charya, Regomat first, Manju Puri and Philip Schnabel in that order. Um, first, give 15 minutes um, this discussion of their work and how it pertains to these topics. And then we're going to go to Q&A from the audience. Yeah, so with this, Viral, do you want to get started? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Antoinette and Amir, uh, for giving me the opportunity. Uh, I'm stepping in for Raghu, who unfortunately can't be here, but uh, delighted uh, to get this uh, chance to present some of our joint work. It's not this one, yeah. Thank you. So uh, what I wanted to talk about is based on uh, some work that Raghu and I have been doing with Rahul Chauhan and Sasha Stefan. Sasha is in the audience. Uh, and it's based on the paper I gave at Jackson Hole in August, uh, perhaps for the right reasons, Everyone thought we were barking up the wrong tree that time, thinking about uh, banks uninsured deposits. Uh, but uh, thankfully, uh, Silicon Valley Bank has helped us out. Uh, okay, so uh, normally we, uh, when we think about the stresses of the last three years, uh, to start with, I would say there was a stress in the banking system in the pandemic outbreak. Uh, there was a very severe dash for cash on bank lines of credit. Uh, uh, the, the shock was in shadow banking uh, that froze and banks actually underperformed the stock market for quite some time, but it wasn't exactly a solvency problem of any significant sort for banks. Uh, then we embarked on massive stimulus, uh, QE, low rates, fiscal stimulus, uh, perhaps the mother of all uh, interventions, at least in our lifetimes. Uh, and the recovery has been very sharp. Uh, and the inflation then turned out to be stubbornly high as well. So uh, the question we are after and what I want to spend some time on is whether the pandemic QE, uh, perhaps along with the fiscal stimulus, uh, set up the stage for the banking stress uh, that we have witnessed. Now, I'm going to talk only about one sliver of the various problems that these banks had, uh, which is to do with the stock of their uninsured uh, bank deposits. Uh, of course, there have been large mark-to-market losses on bank security holdings. There's this famous picture from FDIC. But I want to, what I want you to focus on here, uh, just to keep in mind, is that when in 16, 17, 18, the rates rose, banks did actually make losses at that time on their securities holdings also. It's just that they were not very large. You know, they were on the order of $75 billion. But come 2022, beginning of 2023, and you can see these losses have magnified about 10 times. Uh, about, roughly speaking, about a uh, half of that is due to the faster pace of interest rate hikes, and about half of that is because the bank balance sheets are actually much, much larger. Uh, and we think that the bank balance sheets being so large this time around, their securities holdings being so large, has something to do with quantitative easing and perhaps uh, fiscal stimulus, and that's what uh, we are trying to understand. So uh, once the deposit outflow started in Q2 2022, uh, we eventually had bank runs. And I think most people would agree that perhaps what has been most surprising uh, has been the large share of uninsured deposits on bank balance sheets. Uh, so normally, of course, we take these as given, then we think about runs uh, a la Diamond Dibvig and other such models. Uh, but the question we are asking is about the stock of these uninsured deposits. How does that vary over time? And whether the waxing and waning of the central bank balance sheet has something to do with the stock of uninsured deposits on the bank balance sheet. So like, I think think of that as the main question uh, I'm going to focus on. Okay, so to just motivate this, if you look at uh, Silicon Valley Bank, once we went into low rates and quantitative easing period, uh, the Silicon Valley Bank deposits, which were mostly uninsured, uh, they grew cumulatively by over $100 billion over a very short period of about eight quarters. Okay, this is a very, very fast pace of growth. Uh, you can see it's growing anywhere between 10 to $15 billion a quarter. 
And then, of course, there is first the slow burn uh, and then the very rapid uh, week of deposit outflows. Now, I would hesitate to conclude that the problems of this type are just problems of Silicon Valley banks and such aggressively run banks, because actually this is what's been happening to the banking sector as a whole. And okay, this is an important chart where I'm showing you the uninsured deposits. The line is the fraction of uninsured uh, deposits to total deposits uh, that used to be around 47% before the pandemic stimulus, and it grew to 52, 53% by, uh, by the end of the stimulus. And in quantitative numbers, this is more than $3.5 trillion increase in uninsured deposits of banks. Okay, so this is very, very large. Uh, you can imagine that uh, sources of uncertainty about bank assets, be it interest rates, be it commercial real estate, uh, this could potentially uh, create large runs uh, in the system. Okay, uh, so what we did in our paper, and we are still trying to understand all pieces of it in, in, in all earnestness, uh, is to document these patterns of growth of bank deposits, of demandable deposits, uh, which are at the top in the thick uh, black line. Uh, that's, the un that's the insured component. The dashed line at the top is the uninsured component. Don't focus on much of the rest. What you see here is that Come the pandemic, you see a very massive increase in bank reserves. That's one way of capturing quantitative easing, which is, is the central bank flooding the banking system with reserves. And what you see here is that there is also a massive coincident rise in the bank deposits at that time. Okay? So that's just sort of prima facie evidence that there may be something between these two, that when central banks expand their balance sheets, the stock of deposits in the banking system expands as well. Okay, now you can see here that both insured and uninsured are increasing. Uh, and of course, the natural question to ask is, is there something to do with fiscal stimulus? Because fiscal stimulus is also distributing checks, and that would create uh, also an increase in deposits in the system. So to get at this a little bit, uh, here on the left, I'm showing you the change in uninsured deposits of the banking system on a quarterly basis against the changes in the banking system's reserves. Uh, the this is all the post pandemic stimulus period and you see the red line implies a sort of reasonable positive relationship now if you take out the fiscal stimulus quarters if anything the green line suggests that the link between central bank reserves and banks uh, uninsured liabilities deposits is actually even stronger okay, in contrast if you look at the insured deposit changes on the right hand side once again, you see that, yes, when central bank reserves expand, insured deposits expand. But once you take out the stimulus quarters, fiscal stimulus quarters, actually, there isn't much of a relationship. OK, so what we conclude from this is that insured deposits in the system on the previous graph primarily increased because of fiscal stimulus. The uninsured deposits increase both because of fiscal stimulus, but importantly, also because of quantitative easing. OK, now the question is, how does this come about? Okay, and that's our key insight from the Jackson Hole piece, which is that we are used to thinking of quantitative easing as an expansion of central bank's balance sheet size. Okay, but that's only the central bank side of the story. Typically, when central bank balance sheets expand, it's also associated with an expansion of commercial bank balance sheets. And this expansion happens on the back of uninsured bank deposits. Okay, so I'm going to give you a simple schematic to explain this. So this is the Fed, this is the banking sector, and this is the public, think of them as non-banks. Now, because the holdings of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, which the Fed purchases in QE, are so vast and so widespread, typically quantitative easing involves a tendering of securities by the non-bank system to the Fed via the banks as the intermediaries. Okay, so here Fed is trying to do quantitative easing of $1, so it's purchasing $1 from the market and it's crediting on, as its liability, the bank reserves by $1. So whichever prime, bro prime broker is tendering the securities gets $1 reserve in its commercial bank uh, checking account with, this, with the Fed. Now, of course, the question is what's happening to the deposits of the banking system? They got $1 of extra asset and it's this non-bank, it could be a hedge fund, a mutual fund, a family office, a high net worth individual, an insurance company, they are tendering their security 
uh, which is now reduced by $1 via this bank to the Fed. And what's happened in the process is that we have created a dollar of inside money in the system. Okay, so this non-bank now has a dollar of deposit into the banking system. And because of the scale of these transactions, the financial or the institutional nature of this deposit, this is typically going to be an uninsured bank deposit. Now, there could be second order effects. Uh, this non-bank could go and take out its deposit and instead buy corporate bonds. Now the corporate actually has a deposit into the banking system. They will then turn it around and make payments to suppliers and employees. But whichever way you cut it, the ultimate accounting will have to have created uninsured deposits in the banking system, which we empirically measure, uh, as I showed you, is quite a powerful relationship with the reserves. Okay, so what are the implications of this important insight for the ongoing banking stress? Uh, that quantitative easing, which was of a very rapid and, and large scale of about $4 trillion, that created bank uninsured deposits, and on the left-hand side of bank balance sheet, it created reserves. Now, that by itself could sometimes be enough to destabilize the system if then reserves and deposits don't stand one for one in each balance sheet. You know, there could be an asymmetric distribution. But I think to understand what's going on right now, we don't even need that because there was fiscal stimulus on top of this. So what does fiscal stimulus do? The reserves that went into the banking system now get used to purchase government securities. So first reserves move from the banks to the government account. Then the fiscal stimulus brings it brings the reserves back into the banking system. And therefore, now we are creating another round of amplification of the bank balance sheet size, okay? which is banks are now going to get some insured deposits, but also some uninsured deposits, because some of the stimulus is going to PPP and corporates and so on. So that's not going to be insured deposits. But now banks are also expanding on their left hand side with holdings of government bonds. Okay, So the combination of QE and fiscal stimulus creates a huge stock of uninsured deposits, first created by QE, then some created by fiscal stimulus. And then on the left-hand side, it's created now this interest rate sensitive government, uh, government bonds, which are now on the bank balance sheets. And then if you get inflation and high interest rates, because maybe this was a bit too much for the system, then you basically get runs because the securities are not worth what, they, what you thought they were all uninsured deposits, both created by QE as well as by fiscal stimulus, think they might be on the hook for the losses and they will start running now. Okay, And so it's the interaction of the two which really makes this problem uh, really, really bad. Okay, now the, the final question uh, in the last few minutes is so, okay, it's true that runs can happen or at least drawdowns of deposits can happen, but we injected so much liquidity in the system. For, first 1 trillion, then 4 trillion, then 8 trillion of reserves, where does all this liquidity go? Why isn't there enough to actually meet the system's demands? And the problem is, it's not just that when you do QE, you are injecting reserves in the system, you are also creating demandable claims with immediacy in the system. So the net liquidity creation from the system is far lower than what we think it is, just based on the I notion that we are injecting liquid assets into the system. And on top of that, banks could write other claims on liquidity. They could write credit lines, uh, which can get drawn down upon. So the multiplier of demandable claims may even be larger than the stock of reserves that you have injected into the system. It's our view that this perhaps is a unified story of why we are seeing surprisingly fragile financial conditions. Okay, you see some government tax outflows, so the reserves move into the governments and you get a repo market rollover problem in September 19. Uh, pandemic time, you get a dash for cash from shadow banks and corporations. UK, you get a fiscal shock, and then you have pension funds who can't find enough collateral because there's just too many demandable claims, even though you have too much of a reserve asset uh, which is out there in the system. So what's the final implication of all this? We think that through the size of the central bank balance sheet, we have created a conflict between financial stability and monetary policy, Okay, which is that it's easy to get in, it's easy to expand, but it's a little harder to get out of this problem because for monetary policy, you want to shrink the central bank balance sheet and now take out the reserves, but the entire stock of demandable claims out there is not shrinking at the same pace. And even if it shrinks at the same pace, it's a problem because the distribution may not be that large. So the system has just become too dependent on the Fed it just keeps ratcheting up its balance sheet size. So if you if you see what happened with 
the Bank of England problem, they had to rewind on their quantitative tightening and start injecting money back into the bond market. What's happening with the Fed right now, one arm of Fed for monetary policy is doing quantitative tightening, but the other arm through lender of last resort is effectively doing quantitative easing. It's, it's pumping money back into the system. So uh, we think that the benefits of QE need to be uh, caveated with these downsides on financial fragility front uh, and at the very extreme, perhaps, therefore, maybe when QE is undertaken, if there was an explicit role for financial stability in Federal Reserve's objective function, maybe at least going forward with the hindsight of this knowledge that we have, we would perhaps not do stimulus, which is uh, as large as we undertook this time. Thank you. Uh, Antoinette Amr, thank you for having me uh, talk about it. So I, I have two goals today, or two topics to cover. Uh, first, I want to talk to you about solvency runs, which are runs that happen if people think that a bank is insolvent will become insolvent. But if uninsured depositors believe that a bank is solvent, it will in fact remain solvent and profitable and happily live after ever after. I'll link this to uh, monetary policy and talk about how tightening monetary policy exposes banks to the possibility of a solvency run. That doesn't mean a run will occur, but the chance of such runs increases. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is bank uninsured leverage, a concept that I, Erica, Ahmed, and Tomek have been banding around for now two years. Um, that is a much more interesting concept than bank leverage, which we've all thought about. And then what I'm going to want to talk about a little bit is measurement. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the evidence of how run prone uninsured depositors are, which clearly leads to uninsured depositor runs. And did monetary tightening expose banks to solvency runs in 2023, which is why we're here, okay? Um, so the first paper I want to talk about is the paper with uh, Erica Zhang, Amit, Pisco uh, Amit Seru, and Tomek Piskorski, uh, which we put out three days after uh, SVB suffered a run. And the goal of that paper was sort of twofold. One was um, estimate bank losses uh, on the asset side uh, due to interest rate increases since Q1 2022. In other words, how much did banks lose in unreported assets because interest rates went up? That was pretty straightforward. Uh, the more complicated piece is we were trying to draw implications for bank health, and we settled on trying to think about banks' exposure to the possibility of solvency runs. And I'm going to tell you how we tried to make that connection of the theory of solvency runs to the data that we actually observed. So let's talk about the easy one, which is how do we measure uh, bank losses that were experienced because interest rates went up and banks didn't show to keep track of that on their balance sheet. So we pretty much marked to mark, uh, mark to market uh, bank securities, uh, including RMBS, treasuries, and other non RMBS securities, bank loans in the, and other loans. In that, for example, we differed from the stuff that the FDIC did, the Vero was showing you before. And what did we find? When interest rates increased since Q1 2022, the total unreported losses, uh, losses in the banking sector on the asset side or about $2.2 trillion in total. Put things in context, that is the entire book equity of the US banking sector, okay? Book, not market, okay? What's interesting is the distribution of these losses, which clearly was not uniform across the banking sector, okay? Um, the average bank suffered about 10% decline. Okay? So what we try to do from here on is say, okay, we saw SVB go down. We know asset lo were, lo losses were suffered, can we pinpoint which other banks might be fragile from the Monday after SVB loss, given what we see in the data? And the first thing we noticed in the data is, if you just look on the asset side, what share of asset losses did you suffer? SVB did not look particularly special. In fact, about 10% of banks, about 450 banks in the US, suffered percentage-wise worse losses on the asset side than SVB. So if you want to pinpoint your finger to what's driving the SM SVB run, Eh, asset losses may be a part of the story, but clearly not the whole story, okay? Then SVB was wound down because they were, well, insolvent. So your second thing might be, uh, well, it's capital. Um, it's not really capital, okay? Um, SVB was a poorly capitalized bank, but 10% of banks were worse capitalized than SVB prior to interest rate increases, and about 10% of banks were worse capitalized than SVB post interest rate increases. So again, SVB bad, but particular outlier, not at all, okay? Where was SVB an outlier in the data? In uninsured leverage, okay? Uh, 
Uninsured leverage is a concept we sort of defined when we talked about shadow bank leverage. Uh, and it's really your uninsured leverage relative to assets rather than overall leverage counting insured deposits, okay? And there you see SVB was a big outlier in the data, but again, there are some banks in the US banking system that have a higher uninsured leverage than SVB. Now step back and you tell yourself, okay, so we've pointed our finger to uninsured deposits. Vero talked about this. How do we go from uninsured leverage to trying to figure out, well, which other possible banks could be prone to runs, okay? And our first intuition, I would say, is Diamond Divvick. Okay, Diamond Divvick sort of says, look, runs occur because banks have illiquid assets. So they have to liquidate assets at a discount. It's either chopping down trees or let's call it selling illiquid loans, okay? But that cannot be the central problem for banks in 2023. And I think Doug would agree, SVB did not suffer a Diamond Divvick style run because banks have lots of liquidity. The average bank in the US has about 40% of their balance sheet being super duper liquid. Okay. Um, on Monday, there were huge regulatory intervention after FBB went down, flooding with system with liquidity, but banks kept failing and deposits kept running. So it's not liquidity. So that, what that means is we need a model of uninsured deposit runs in banks that have super liquid assets. Okay. And why do we need that? Because if you have a wrong model, you end up with misguided policy. For example, the a Fed report on the SVB reports on liquidity 318 times that's after svb goes down and mentioned solvency once okay because all eyes are because Doug was so successful on liquidity but we fixed the liquidity problem okay um so the question is do we have a way to think about runs in liquid banks and luckily uh, for me we do and it's uh, the work i have with mark egan who's right there and uh, ali hortatsu uh, in the ar in 2017. so how does a run work in a bank when assets are fully liquid, what you need is bank market power in the deposit market, okay? You need really a deposit franchise value model to deal with that. And you can get a bad run equilibrium simply in the following way. Um, if depositors think the bank will go down, they either withdraw deposits or demand a compensation for the risk they're bearing. Either way, banks are less profitable. In this model, withdrawals and increasing interest rates on deposits are about the same thing, okay? Banks become less profitable, so bank equity declines, banks are more likely to fail, voila, depositors were actually right to run, we have a bad equilibrium. You can also have a good equilibrium, just like in Diamond Divvick, if we all think banks are profitable, we don't have to withdraw deposits, banks make a boatload of money off of deposits, like JP Morgan is still paying zero, are very profitable, and they're very stable, okay? So that's what we did in that paper. What we did not do in that paper is think about monetary policy, okay? So in the paper that was then trying to analyze stability, we thought, hmm, how do we think about possible interaction of monetary policy and solvency runs? Well, it's pretty clear. Interest rates go up, asset values decline, that exposes you to the possibility of a solvency run. Even though in the good equilibrium, banks might still be super profitable, and in fact, their asset values might go up, like in Philip uh, Philip's work, okay? So good equilibria can remain equally good, but bad equilibria become more and more and more plausible, okay? So the question then is, how do you take this idea and map it into data to evaluate whether there is in fact a possibility of a self-fulfilling solvency, okay? You can do it two ways. In the 2017 paper, we applied this to the Great Recession. We measured first in the data, how responsible are uninsured depositors to bank risk of default? Elasticity about, is about minus 0.6. That doesn't tell you much, okay? Uh, they walk but not run for exits. But during the Great Recession, deposits, uninsured deposits fled weak banks to strong banks also. And then you can do what we did in 2017. You plug it in a structural model. You compute all the possible equilibria and you can do fun things like, what would happen with the worst equilibrium if you cranked up capital requirements? Obviously, that was not practical if we were going to do this in three days for the whole U.S. banking system to evaluate things forward. So we did something simpler, but I actually think quite sensible as a back of the envelope. We said the following. Suppose a certain share of depositors wakes up and freaks out, be it 10%, 20%, 30%, and so on. How many, of, how many depositor runs could a bank survive from a perspective of not impairing insured deposits? Okay, 
And if it can't survive it, then these depositors will write to run and we have a self-fulfilling run possibility. That doesn't mean a run is gonna happen, but if depositors were to freak out, it could, okay? So what did we find? If about 10% of depositors wake up and freak out, about 66%, uh, 66 banks in the US are vulnerable to a solvency run. If the number that was then later really made the headlines, if about half of depositors are wake up and freak out, about 190 banks in the US could be possibly subject to a solvency run, okay? So this is sort of the central way we were trying to evaluate whether banks could be subject to solvency runs. Of course, if we guarantee all deposits, then, you know, depositors say, well, there is no freak out and, you know, banks could remain solvent and extract uh, rents from uninsured depositors, okay? Uh, what we did, and I think this is, I'll call it an out of sample test because we put this out on Monday as, after SVB, we computed this bank by bank. And where I think we got a little bit of exposed validation is, you know, we did not name banks because, well, that sounded like a bad idea. Um, but we did compute for every bank the possibility of a run. And for example, First Republic, which looked very much run prone in our data and according to our calculation, went down. So did a bunch of other banks that were in trouble. In fact, if you look at the stats, the regional banks, are the ones that kind of start looking pretty bad on uninsured leverage and asset declines and so on, okay? So I'll argue um, the data bore us out exposed. This was the one time where we actually like, you know, at least somewhat were able to um, predict this, okay? So where do I wanna wrap up? Um, this was the main article on CNBC yesterday. Uh, the American banking landscape is on the cusp of a seismic shift. And pretty much saying, look, the U.S. banking system is uh, somewhat undercapitalized. We're going to have to have mergers. Uh, for me, what stands out is hopefully now, several months after SVB, uh, we can put to, to bed the idea that this is that runs are just driven by liquidity uh, because liquidity does not fix solvency issues. OK, and we have to start thinking a bit more broadly about what does it mean for a bank to be unstable? Um, we did put out a couple of complementary papers to the first one. One was on hedging. Um, did banks hedge? Um, hopefully you all looked at that one. No. Um, the second one was, uh, in fact, some of them like SVB wound down their hedges as the interest rates were going up. Uh, the second one, which uh, was, how about commercial real estate distress? Okay. And pretty much if you look at that paper, what we said was, look, commercial real estate is a big share of bank portfolios. If we get to commercial real estate losses of about the Great Recession, not a big deal at all for a healthy banking sector, okay? But for a banking sector that's lost about $2.2 trillion in asset values, yep, you can move about 30 other banks into the possibility of a solvency run, and that could be a problem, okay? So thank you very much. Okay, I'd like to thank uh, Antoinette and Amir for inviting me to talk in this panel. And so my comments are going to be based on three papers which are empirically oriented and examine bank runs in two different countries, India and the US, in three different time periods using micro level data. And so, you know, while we have uh, award winning, Nobel Prize winning uh, papers on bank runs, we have relatively little empirical evidence on how on depositors' responses and how they behave. And so that's where the, these papers are going to center. So in the first paper, in the interest of time, I'm going to continue as this is happening. So in the first paper, which I did with uh, Raj Ayer, we looked at a bank in India that failed. It's not working anymore. Yeah. yeah. So we had detailed deposit uh, microdata from a small cooperative bank in India, which faced a shock and survived. And so we asked which classes of depositors run. Now in India also, there is deposit insurance, though not quite as seamless as FDIC deposit insurance. So think of it as somewhat imperfect deposit insurance. And we said, does it matter? Does deposit insurance, even when it's imperfect, make a difference? We asked, what about social networks? Does that make a difference? And then we ask what deposits are actually stable. So Basel III talks a lot about stable deposits, 
And we ask, are stable deposits always stable or are they conditionally stable? To give an example, one of the results we found in this paper was that depositors who had loan linkages were more likely to run. Now, what does that mean? Is it that they're just, sorry, less likely to run? So is it that they never run, they're just stable? Or is it that they have better information? Which means if there's actually a big shock, they are more likely to run, right? And in order to answer that, we decided we needed a bank which faces a run and survives, and then later on faces a run and fails. We identified and got data from the bank. And so that is the second paper. And we asked, what is the differential run behavior when a bank has a low versus high solvency shock? In order to see, are, stable, are these actually stable deposits, as Basil III would say, or are they conditionally stable, where you have this underlying information? And the answer is, some are stable. It depends on the kind of relationship, and others are actually conditionally stable. More on that later. And then finally, I worked at the FDIC, and who does the resolution of failed banks to encourage them to you know get all the wonderful data they have to actually look at failed bank behavior in the us so using micro data there there we ask now deposit insurance in the us which has historically been remarkably effective the bank closes on friday monday you get your money back seamless does it you know how effective is it and we look at both outflows as well as inflows now, during the Great Recession in 2008, temporary deposit insurance was introduced, TAG. So in order to protect you know, payroll and business accounts, non-interest bearing transaction accounts had unlimited deposit insurance. Did people understand it? Did it work? And so that's what we address in the third paper. And so put together these three papers, these are the questions I'll talk about, and, and I'll give at least partial answers. Does deposit insurance matter? Do temporary measures such as TAG, because we have a lot in today's crisis about, well, what about the small guy? What about payrolls? What do we do about that? Is there an alternative to unlimited deposit insurance? Well, TAG was an alternative. Did it work? And then how often do uninsured depositors actually lose money in failed banks? Everyone says they lose all the time. Turns out it's not true. They rarely lose their money and more on that. What about insured depositor behavior? A lot of the focus is on uninsured depositors running. Do insured depositors run? Turn out they do with a different level of intensity, but they do. What about the role of relationships? And relationships, you, it, you should be careful to define in many different ways because different relationships in different ways actually do matter. And then what about the role of social networks? Even before social media, likely amplified by social media, but what, what effect do social networks have for runs? The general belief is deposit insurance matters, and hence the deposit insurance limit has steadily been going up to what it currently is, which is a quarter million. Okay, so first, does deposit insurance matter? So let's look what these three papers say. Looking at three different banks, two different countries, three different time periods, the answer is a resounding yes. Even when deposit insurance is imperfect, it is the case. Uninsured depositors do run more. They are quicker to run. So not only do they pull out more money, they are quicker to run. Often they will run even before bank-specific bad information is out there. So if you look in the US, when the formal enforcement action is announced, by that time, all the uninsured time deposits have already fled. These are sophisticated depositors. They're moving well before, well before these public signals are, are coming in. Okay, does deposit insurance matter? Well, what's different between historically and today, as my fellow panelists have pointed out, the sheer size of uninsured deposits. Between 2009 to 2022, it's grown three times, from 2.3 trillion to 7.7 .7 trillion. These are disproportionately concentrated in large banks. So the banks in the top 1% have 66% of uninsured deposits. Now, another thing that we have seen historically, right, especially in the US, is that when banks were in trouble, there was a substitution of uninsured deposits with insured deposits. What was the mechanism? The bank was in trouble. They would heighten, they would raise their interest rates. 
and they would get time deposits right under that 250,000 limit, right? And so the banks that we study, and then we looked at, you know, more broadly at call reports, if you look at the total, out, you know, total outflows, they're losing one third, but aggregate deposits are the same because they're making it up through, these, through this uh, inflow. Now, this typically takes place over weeks. Now, in Silicon Valley Bank, you lost 25% of the deposits in one day. It was predicted to be 40% the next day. Obviously, there just isn't enough time for many of the standard mechanisms to work. Now, what about temporary deposit insurance, right? And I think this is particularly relevant in today's policy discussion because people are saying, okay, what do we have? Do we keep deposit insurance the way it is? Do we have unlimited deposit insurance with all the moral hazard issues that we know we're likely to have? Do we have something in between? Well, we had an in-between experiment and that was TAG, right? And that was introduced in 2008. It was there for two years, then it was replaced by the Dodd-Frank Act, which sort of extended something similar for another two years. And essentially you have unlimited insurance for checking accounts. So it covers the payment and operation of payroll and business accounts. And our research suggests TAG worked brilliantly. It worked as well as regular deposit insurance. People understood it and it reduced deposit outflows. Now, how much do uninsured depositors lose? A common assumption made theoretically and almost everywhere that I see in, in academic papers is uninsured depositors lose all their money. This is simply not true. If you look at the failed banks, right, that in the Great Recession, in only 6% of those failed banks did uninsured depositors actually lose their money. Why? When you put the bank on the block, the acquiring bank wants these valuable depositors. They want that franchise. These are the guys with money. So they make them halt. So most of the time, nobody loses any money. Occasionally they do, but only 6% of the time, as, as, this, uh, as these numbers show, which, which are sourced from FDIC. What about insured depositor behavior? A common assumption is insured depositors do not run. This is not true. In all three banks that we study, two different countries, three different time periods, insured depositors do run. Now they run, with less intensity. So in the US, if you look at how much do they pull, so it's either you're not paying attention, you don't pull out your money, or you pay attention, you pull out all your money, or you pay attention and you pull out half your money. That, that's typically sort of the behavior that we, we see. Now it gets less attention. Now obviously the magnitude of uninsured depositors is much more, but this is not something to be ignored. Now, what about the role of relationships? There's a huge literature in banking that so many of you have contributed to that suggests relationships are important. We all believe this, but typically what do relationships do? They give information to the bank about the client, right? There's a signal. Now in bank runs, think of the reverse happening. And that is now the depositor is getting a signal about the bank health through the relationship, right? And what we find is relationships are important and importantly, I'm going to point to only one, and that is depositors with loan linkages. Now, when you have a shock and you survive, you're fundamentally healthy. These guys don't run. But if it's a really bad shock and the bank goes under, they're the first to run. So thinking that stable deposits, you have stable and unstable deposits is just not the right way to think about it. These are conditionally stable deposits, which fundamentally depend on the underlying health of the bank. Next, let's think of social networks, right? Everyone talks about it, very hard to measure, right? How do you know if someone is actually in your network? So we have the standard problems if you use geography, the Munsky reflection problem, et cetera. So what we were able to do because of the Indian institutional framework in India, if you need to open a bank account, you have to get someone who already has a bank account to introduce you. So we use this as the introducer network. The great advantage is we know you know each other, right? You, you introduced each other. And what we find in the, there, we actually have time stamped bank withdrawals. So what we find is that people within the introduction and the same network, they have a much higher transmission probability of running. So, you know, we're all colleagues, we work at the same place, you run, I'm much more likely to run. 
Not only that, we're colleagues, we're in the same institution, we, we have lunch, we say this bank is going under, we all get up, transmission probability is highest at lunchtime, and when you actually look at the line of the timestamps, we are the people standing behind each other. You actually see this on the day. So this is what a traditional bank run looks like. You go to FDIC, these, these pictures are everywhere. But this is not what a bank run looks like anymore. We know, right? Thanks to electronic banking, you don't have to get up and queue up outside that, right? Your aunt doesn't have to drive all the way to some godforsaken place to, to draw her deposits, right? And so what is, so currently the speed of transfer of funds has increased enormously, right? And so speed, because you don't have to stand in the line and you can do these electronic transfers. Now think of Silicon Valley Bank, where you had VCs and portfolio firm, a lot of common ownership, a lot of cross ownership, very strong social networks. This is very much in line with our evidence that social networks matter. The social, strong social networks led to coordinated withdrawals with VCs telling their portfolio companies to draw down their deposits. So let me sort of conclude and just put this all together, right? And because there's a lot of empirical work, but hopefully it'll make sense. Does a deposit insurance matter? The answer is yes. Uninsured depositors run more, they run quicker. This is across countries, across time. What about new temporary measures of deposit insurance that just cover business and payroll, these non-interest bearing checking accounts? Do they work? Yes, they were effective. And you, you actually saw less withdrawals when TAG was introduced. What about insured depositor behaviors? Insured depositors also run. It's a, it is a misnomer to think that they don't. They run, but with less intensity. Often it's about half the limit. Now what about the role of relationships? Relationships are important. Now, if you look at account age, it behaves in a completely different manner. If you bank with that man forever, chances are you're never gonna run. But if you have a loan linked account, then it tends to be a conditional, you know, it's based on the underlying information. If it's really bad, you run, otherwise you don't. And then what about social networks? It's important. The transmission probability is very high. And we measure this, you know, looking at virus spreading in biology using those methodologies. If you run, am I more, you know, if, if you have a viral disease, am I more likely to get it same way? If you run, am I more likely to get it in the same um, network? Yes, the transmission probability is sky high. And so when we're doing these coordination games of bank runs, where do the signals come from? These are saying these are two potential sources of the signals, social networks and relationships. Now, what are new developments that can affect the dynamics? One, the sheer scale of uninsured deposits and the speed of withdrawals, right? I mean, we're talking of typically in the, in, in the banks I studied, if you had four or 5% withdrawing, that is terrible news. Here you had 25%. I mean, this, it, it, it's just ridiculous amount of withdrawals. And then social media interacting with social networks and amplifying you know, this coordination, I think is something else to think about. Thank you. Last but not least, Philip. <laughs> uh, well, thanks a lot for having me here. It's a big pleasure to be part of this panel. What I thought would be most useful for the discussion today is to just give you a sense uh, of what happened over the last couple of months. So I will try to put them into a framework, at least the way I understand it. So I think any discussion of the last few months has to sort of, you know, start with the rise in interest rates. Um, and, you know, since 2021, the Fed has raised the short-term rates by now more than 5%. And so as a result of that, long-term rates, which reflect future expected future short rates, uh, increased by about 2.5%. And so, you know, if you want to get a back of the envelope estimate of how that affected bank assets, well, you just look at the size of tall bank assets, so tall long-term loans and securities. They have an average duration across all asset class of around four years. And you can use simple bond math to say, well, a rise of 2.5% time a duration of you know, four years, size of the balance sheet 17 trillion, and you get a number of around 1.7 trillion. Uh, and that's sort of roughly in the same ballpark of as Gregor had as well, 
Uh, and, you know, I want to point out that it's, it's not hard to calculate that. So contrary to credit risk, you know, we know how to calculate interest rate risk um, very easily. And it's large, uh, as Greg Oza pointed out, it's large relative to bank equity. It's sort of the same order of magnitude. So if they're all there is to banks, if all they have is the bank assets, effectively this would suggest that banks should be bankrupt, they should be insolvent. Now, if you look at the stock market during that time, this is not exactly what the stock market was telling us. So here I'm plotting the S&P 500 and those are a bank stock index from mid 2001 to you know, most recently, uh, June 23. And I wanna make two observations. So first of all, even during the time when the Fed was raising rates, so these losses I've just been talking about have been piling up, it didn't seem to affect bank stocks. So bank stocks actually were holding up, they were just doing as well as the market of all up to the SVP failure. Now, clearly SVP was sort of watershed moment, bank stock declined by roughly 30%, this data somewhat depressed, but you know, by no means, you know, the stock market told us that the total banking sector is insolvent. So there must be something else which is holding up bank value. And if you're familiar with the work I have of Alexis Savo, who is here, Anita Madrexa, will not be surprised to hear that I think you know what's holding up bank value to a large extent is the deposit franchise. So I would argue one thing, uh, maybe the thing which makes banks special is that they issue deposits. We know depositors has been discussed to value them for the convenience, the safety, the liquidity. And so they're willing to accept low deposit rates. And so effectively that gives banks pricing power. You could even call it market power when interest rates go up. In fact, when interest rates go up, banks become much more profitable. Deposit becomes much more profitable for banks. So one way to measure that uh, is with what we call the deposit beta. Um, deposit beta is just sort of a measure of how much the deposit rates increase when uh, the Fed's fund rate increase. So uh, historically, the average deposit beta is about 0.4. So that means if there's 100 basis points increase in the Fed funds rate, you would see on average a 40 basis points increase in deposit rates. That also means that banks actually capture the remainder for themselves. So effectively they capture 60% of the rise in the Fed funds rate. Now, how did that work out during the current hiking cycle? So here I'm just plotting average national deposit rates from the FDIC. So you can see the Fed funds rate now going to 5%, but deposit rates just as they've done uh, in previous cycles have not uh, held up. They have not uh, repriced uh, at the same speed. So you can see interest checking in green is still paying zero. Savings deposits, the main form of deposits is paying somewhere around 50 basis points and time deposits pay a bit more, 1.5 percentage points, but clearly much lower than uh, the Fed's fund rate. Now to be clear, there are a lot of banks out there, online banks, you know, money market funds, which offer more attractive returns so there are higher deposit rates out there, but this is, these are the deposit rates which the average deposits are actually earning primarily at the large banks. Now, what does that mean when you compare it historically? So here I'm just plotting the distribution of deposit betas. This is estimated um, of over previous hiking cycles. So this is from my JF paper with Alexi Niedema. We actually posted this uh, data on our website. That's where the number 0.4 is coming from. You see there's some distribution. Some banks have a very strong deposit franchise. They have a lower beta. Some have a less strong deposit franchise. They have a higher beta, So, but it's around 0.4. Now, if you look at what happens with betas in this rate cycle, you can compare them to what there was in history. Now, one caveat, the latest data we have, the latest call reports, we have to end in March. So clearly we haven't all priced in yet, but still I think it's interesting to compare with what the betas during this hiking cycle looked like. And so far, the beta is actually much lower, consistent with the previous graph I've showed you. So that means banks have been actually capturing a large share of the increase in the Fed funds rate. So what I expect these betas to increase over time, um, you know, probably get a much closer to the historical betas. In fact, if you listen to banks now, some of them are starting to release their own estimates of the betas will be. They're sort of more closer where the historical betas are. But in some sense, the historical betas, I think, are still a good guide to think about what's happening to these deposits during this hiking cycle. So 
if you take the historical number of 0.4, which I just argued is reasonable, say, well, what does that mean for deposit franchise to be a hedge to this losses on the asset side? Well, banks roughly have 17 trillion deposits. Um, you know, they basically earn this spread of 60% with a beta of 0.4. So if the Fed funds rate is around 5%, that means they earn 5% times 60%, a deposit spread of 3%. So that's the benefit of having financing itself with deposits relative to borrowing at the competitive short rate. Now, 3% of 17 trillion of deposits, well, that means they actually increase their income by a little bit more than 500 billion per year. So, you know, if they're able to earn this for three and a half years, in some sense, they can earn back these asset losses uh, they have suffered. So a different way to say the same thing, I would argue that deposits went from being highly unprofitable to highly profitable. And Alexei Itam and I, we posted sort of a, present value estimate of this. Now, it depends really on what beta you put in there. Um, but if you use something like the historical beta, it suggests there could even be a full offset. Now, one way to evaluate whether this is actually working, whether deposit franchise is a good hedge, is to look at the net interest margin. So we already talked about the net interest margin earlier. In this context, it's useful in the following sense. If you get your hedge right, Basically, your assets reprice, you pick the right duration of your assets, the assets reprice at the same speed as the deposits, which means that your net interest margin doesn't change as interest rate change. Now, I would argue that is the business model of banks, or at least has been for the last few decades. So this is from my GF paper with Lex and Itama. If you back in time, yes, net interest margin moves around a bit for regulatory reasons, for technological reasons, you know, potentially because of the decline in interest rates. But what's important, if you look at the red line, it doesn't move in response to changes in interest rates. Even if they went very high during the Volcker period, you know, net interest margin of banks barely changed. As they came down, it didn't change either. So that suggests that banks are actually very good at doing this hedging of the asset side with their deposit franchise. And you can also zoom in. If you zoom in, this is from the FDIC. They have a quality report. Um, this is sort of like more recently what happened to the net interest margin. You actually see that it was declining during COVID. That's coming from the fact that they had all to hold all these reserves uh, because of QE, as Viral had discussed. But if anything, net interest margins have actually improved. And that's the reason that when we started raising, you know, you would see a lot of newspaper articles saying, well, this is going to be good for banks because, you know, finally, you know, after a long time at the zero lower bound, they're actually going to earn some money on their deposits. Now, this is sort of a rosy picture, but obviously we ended up with like giant banking terminal. So the question is what went wrong? So I'd argue there's sort of two separate points. So first of all, it's clear that some banks didn't really follow this model. I would argue the banking sector of all based on these statistics did, but that doesn't mean every single bank did. And you know, some banks simply went too long on the interest rate risk relative to deposit franchise they had. Now we can talk all day about SVB, but one thing which I think is very telling, which came out of the Fed report, which was released, is that they actually increased the interest rate in early 2022. And so as a result, they ended up way too long on interest rate risk. And I think you know argue something similar for First Republic. But what I think is actually in some sense a little bit more interesting is even if you're completely hedged to interest rate risk, that doesn't mean you're hedged to run risk. So Diamond Divic is sort of coming back. Well, if banks suffer run, well, then this hedge is not going to work. The hedge is going to disappear. And, you know, all there is is to value the assets. And so what I think is interesting, and actually Alexi Itamar and Olivier is also here. I've written a paper on this now. Uh, what happens is if the interest rate goes up, just as I showed the deposit franchise becomes a larger share of bank value. But arguably the deposit franchise is a runnable asset. We could say it's illiquid, it's an intangible. So that means, you know, if there's a run, it's going to be destroyed. And so what can happen is that you have a diamond dipvic type run equilibrium, even if all the loans and all the securities are perfectly liquid. So one takeaway from this is that really what's causing us troubles here, and I think something we have to sort of think more about going forward is the uninsured deposit franchise 
the one coming from the low beta uninsured deposits, the ones where you charge your spread. So checking accounts, savings accounts of sort of these flighty deposits is a source of risk. And in our paper, we discuss various ways how banks and maybe regulators may want to deal with that. Now, in terms of outflows, what we have seen over the last few months, maybe just make two observations. So first of all, clearly there were the outflows from regional banks. A lot of it went to the large banks. Here I'm just plotting deposit growth on regional and smaller banks. That was very much concentrated around SVB, you know, roughly 240 billion, we estimate, went out of the regional banks, a lot of it to the large banks. Now, it looks like these outflows stopped, but anecdotally, we know that some of the regional banks seem to be much higher deposit rates, either to the existing deposits or to replace other deposits, borrowing from the federal home loan banks or maybe from the broker deposit market. So I think it will be interesting to see us the results for the second quarter going to come out, we may discover that some regional banks are actually in bigger trouble than what we think right now. And all you need to do is to look at the net interest margin is going to tell you basically where the deposits reprice faster than the assets for some of these banks. So that's probably sort of confined to the regional banks, but that's something we're still going to learn over the next weeks or months. But another observation I want to make is we also had outflows from the banking system overall. And some deposits clearly left because of the SVB failure. But separately from that, conceptually separately from that, many deposits also left because what I would call the deposit channel of monetary policy, which builds on my paper with Ethan Manolex in the QG. The logic there is us deposits rates stay low, as I showed you. Some deposits, independent of runs or SVB, you know, in previous hiking cycles, we have seen that they move to higher paying alternatives like money market funds. So what we estimate in the QG paper is the deposits, core deposits, the ones where you charge your spread, shrink by roughly 3% for each 100 basis points Fed funds rate increase. But importantly, that's the intended effect of monetary policy. I would argue that's what the Fed is trying to do when it tightens and wants to affect financial conditions. And if you look at tall deposits, so I would argue that this deposit channel is very much at work. So here I'm plotting tall deposits, I'm focusing on core deposits, the main form of deposits. So I'm indexing that to 100 um, at the beginning of the hiking cycle. And what you see is even before SVP, 5% of core deposits left the banking sector because yes, banks had this low deposit betas and some deposits left. Now during SVP, you know, maybe another three percent based on this uh left the banking sector what's very interesting is you might say well we had svb everybody would read about this in the newspaper you know even if not worry about the health of my bank now I really learned that i'm paying a lot for my deposits maybe i want to leave so i don't think it was obvious what we expect but if anything you know the recent data suggests that this is sort of flattened out again so i would argue if you were at the beginning of 2022 and you had to predict what deposit outflow is going to be and you just sort of applied the framework of a deposit channel you would have ended up very much at the same place so one way to interpret that is the svp run in some sense brought some outflows forward which might have happened anyway um, but just to put it in perspective basically these outflows of around eight percent of core deposits you know relative to an increase in the fed funds of five percent suggest deposit outflows so far and i'm sure there's more to come around point 1.6%. So that's actually a little less than what we have seen historically based on the deposit channel. So let me just leave you with two takeaways. So first of all, bank hedge the interest rate risk with the deposit franchise, I would argue, but I think going forward, we have to think hard about the low beta uninsured deposits. And second, yes, banks experience, you know, banking sector all large deposit outflows, some of it because of SVB, but also the deposit channel of monetary policy is back at work. And I think it's important to conceptually distinguish between these two reasons for outflows. Thank you.